All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our regularly scheduled Tuesday at noon Facebook Live. Today, I'm joined with my friend and colleague, Camille. Hi, Camille. Thank Hi. you for joining today. So today, we are going to talk about reactivity. We're going to talk about what it is, what it looks like, how to identify if your dog might be reactive, and how to help them start feeling better. So for majority of this talk, I'm actually going to duck out of the conversation and let Camille kind of take control of this one. And then at the end, I'll be popping back in for a Q&A. So if you guys have questions about your dog or about some of the stuff that Camille is talking about, please feel free to drop it in the comments below and we will absolutely get to it. All right, guys. So Camille, thank you for joining and I'll let you take control here. Hi, everyone. So today we're talking about reactivity. Um, so, you know, the first thing we want to go over is what is reactivity? What is it exactly? Um, so in a nutshell, reactivity really is a dog overreacting to some kind of stimulus in the environment. Um, so my most my favorite example um, is using a human term. So let's say I'm at Starbucks waiting in line. The line has been a little bit long, so you know, kind of getting a little bit tired. And somebody walks in and cuts right in front of me. Now, normal reaction, I could just say, uh, excuse me, there's a line, right? Maybe I'm a little bit annoyed, but that's a normal reaction. If I'm overreacting, so if I'm a reactive person, um, that would mean I would slap the person right across the face, right? So our dogs pretty much with reactivity is the same thing. So dogs see something and instead of having a kind of normal reaction to it, they go way overboard. Um, and usually what it looks like is dogs lunging, barking, um, lots of vocalization. Sometimes it's not straight up barking, but very high pitched whining or what I call screaming. Um, a lot of times they'll, you know, want to go forward, want to get closer to the trigger. Um, at that point, they typically have a very hard time focusing on anything else but the thing that they just saw. Um, and so, you know, obviously it is a challenge for us and for our dogs. Now, generally speaking, um, reactivity falls into two different categories. So you have fear-based reactivity, which is, you know, dog is afraid of the trigger of what they're seeing. Um, and you also have over arousal or over excitement reactivity. So dogs see something, they really want to go and say hi, and oh my God, I can't wait. Um, and now it doesn't really matter at the core, you know, when you look at your own dog, which type of reactivity um, you have to deal with. So you don't have to try and kind of go and figure it out on your own because our intervention strategies, which we'll kind of cover a little bit later are going to be the same regardless of whether your dog is reacting out of fear or reacting out of um, over excitement. Um, what typically causes reactivity? Um, so with fear-based reactivity a lot of times it is caused by a lack of socialization or improper socialization. So dogs um, don't really know what to do when they see the scary thing. Um, they might not have had exposure to it, um, so they're worried about it. They don't know what to do, and so they kind of go into that overreaction um, behavior. What also can happen um, is a as a result of a bad experience or trauma. Um, so a lot of times with dogs who are reactive to other dogs, um, you can kind of trace it back to a dog who has a really who had had a really bad experience with another dog on leash who was attacked by another dog um, when they were younger and so that kind of stayed with them and now they're worried about um, dogs when they see them in general. Um, another thing that also plays into reactivity is genetics. Um, some dogs unfortunately are born um, on the shyer side, on the cautious side, they tend to have um, stronger fear of things um, and a stronger propensity to overreact to things they find scary. Um, and then when, I, when we look at over arousal, you know, excitement based reactivity, some of the causes are the same. So, you know, improper socialization usually plays a big part. Um, so that's typically dogs that were um, as puppies allowed or used to, you know, saying hi, interacting with every dog or person they saw. Uh, and now that they're bigger or a little bit older, um, those things bring about excitement. Oh my God, there's a dog. Yeah, that's my friend. Let's go play. Um, and they get frustrated because they can't get there quite fast enough. 
Um, age also plays a factor in arousal-based reactivity. A lot of teenagers, so dogs between the six months to year, year and a half, tend to kind of go through that kind of reactivity on leash because again, um, they're used to interacting with things as puppies and now they're bigger and you know they can't necessarily do the same things they should do they could do as puppies. Um, teenagers also typically tend to struggle with impulse control. So they tend to not um, deal with frustration well and the leash is definitely a source of frustration for most dogs because they're kind of stuck in place and they can't get to what they want. Um, so those are pretty much the big factors that tend to be at the root of reactivity. So again, lack of socialization or improper socialization, um, having some kind of a bad experience at some point, um, genetics plays a role into it, um, and age also kind of come, comes into the mix. And sometimes, you know, a lot of times it's a kind of multiple factors that interplay, but those are usually the big, um, big ones that we usually see. Um, now, a lot of times, reactivity tends to be confused and or equated with aggression. So a lot of times I have people reach out to me with, oh my God, my dog is aggressive to other dogs, other people. And when I get there and see the dog, the dog is actually reactive. So what's the difference? Um, pretty much aggression is straightforward intent to do harm, right? So let's go back to my Starbucks example, right? So normal person waiting in line, somebody cuts in front of me. As a normal person, I might just say, excuse me, there's a line. As a reactive person, I might slap the person. Um, and although that is an aggressive maneuver, it's a direct reaction to a trigger, right? Somebody cut in line, I overreacted to that. Um, if I were an aggressive person, that would mean I would be going into Starbucks um, with the sole and only purpose to go punch the barista in the face. And that's the only thing I wanted to do. Um, have the intent, it's kind of planned, um, and it's not a reaction of anything else. Um, so with dogs, it's pretty much very similar. Dogs who are aggressive intend to do harm to a trigger. They typically are not loud. Aggression tends to be very quiet um, because it has to be efficient, right? If you're intent on doing harm to something or killing something, you're not going to announce, hey, I'm coming over, I'm going to punch you in the face. Um, you just kind of go and do it. Now, that being said, reactive dogs, although most of the time are not aggressive dogs, um, reactivity can definitely tip into aggression. Um, and both with fear reactivity and with excitement-based reactivity. So with fear-based reactivity, what typically happens is dog sees a trigger, trigger is coming closer and closer, the dog feels trapped because they're on leash or because we hold them back or because they're stuck somewhere in the fence and they can't get away. And so now their flight response has been removed. The only option they have left is to fight, right? So they're reactive. They kind of really would have wanted to get away, but that option is taken away. So now they have to resort to aggression to make the scary thing stop. With over arousal, uh, what tends to happen is the excitement gets so intense as they get closer and closer to the thing they want to say hi to, oh my God, um, that they go into bitey mode. So a lot of dogs, when they're overexcited, get bitey. Um, and it can definitely tip into such a level of excitement and arousal that the dog kind of loses control um, and they'll start to regress. What can also happen with um, I mean, both fear-based, but especially with excitement-based reactive dogs, is that they rush to go see the trigger, especially with other dogs. So they'll rush to see the other dog. And because they're so excited, they're being quite rude with their approach and a little too intense. And so the other dog they're saying hi to kind of snaps and tells them, whoa, stop it. And the overexcited dog um, then gets into a fight. Right, so they didn't intend to start a fight, but it happened because they came on too strongly, they were rude about it, the other dog was not happy about that, and because the excited dog is in that you know state of overexcitement and not really thinking clearly, it just escalates into a fight. What can also happen when it comes to that interplay of reactivity and aggression is you can get redirected aggression. So that happens typically when you have a dog on leash or a dog behind a fence and they see a trigger, 
they can't get to it because they're prevented from the leash or the fence. And so they can't get to their trigger, so they'll redirect to the thing closest to them, which usually is either us or another dog, right? Especially with fence fighting, when you have multiple dogs and one dog reacts to something behind the fence, and the other dog kind of joins, tags along, and then they start fighting together because the initially reactive dog is frustrated that they can't get to their actual trigger. Um, <clears throat> so again, while reactivity in and of itself does not equal aggression, it can definitely and quite easily tip into aggression um, if left unchecked. So obviously that's why we also want to address reactivity. Not only is it an issue for us and our dogs, um, but it can definitely escalate into something more serious. Um, so when we talk about reactivity, and you've heard me say already a lot of times, we're talking about triggers and thresholds. So trigger is pretty much whatever the dog reacts to is a trigger. Um, you can have a single pretty well-defined trigger. So an example of that is a dog that pretty much only reacts to large black dogs coming towards them. Any other dog, um, if they're walking away, don't care. If a big black dog is coming towards us, the dog will react. Um, you can also have multiple um, and not really well-defined triggers. Um, so those are dogs that react to big dogs and small dogs, kind of willy-nilly. Um, dogs that are reactive to other dogs as well as people, um, dogs that can be reactive to other things in the environment, typically moving things, so strollers, skateboards, cars, um, and those kind of all play together. So what is the importance of triggers? Uh, obviously, if we can define our dog's trigger, it becomes a lot easier to address it because we can be proactive and say, oh, hold on. There's a big black dog ahead of us. My dog does not like big black dogs. Maybe I should do something about it now instead of, well, let's keep going and then see what happens. Um, so we do want to have a nice um, list of triggers. Even if your dog has multiple triggers, you can still kind of have a list of things that typically will trigger some kind of reaction so that we can kind of get um, a plan together to work through each trigger individually. Another thing that's very important when we talk about reactivity is the concept of threshold. So a threshold is really the distance at which the dog starts to react, right? Um, or the distance at which the dog um, starts to lose all focus on us and starts to fixate on the trigger. So pretty much how close has the scary thing have to be to my dog before my dog starts um, getting nervous, anxious, um, and starts reacting. So a lot of times with thresholds, you want to be very delicate um, and we want to work under thresholds. So we want to have our dogs in a mental space where they can see the trigger, but they're nice and relaxed and they notice it's there, but they're not um, getting overly anxious. Um, so how do we know if we crossed our threshold. So if we get too far, so if you're completely over threshold in a red zone, your dog is full on reacting, lunging, barking, pulling on the leash, um, full blown out um, reaction. But things happen before we get to that overblown crazy reaction part. Typically, the dog will start to fixate, right? Their attention will get very strongly glued onto the thing that they see. Dog will be unable to focus on you. Um, so if you ask to them to sit, to call their name, kind of nothing goes into their mind. They typically at that point will not take food, even if it's really high value food. Um, so you could dangle steak in front of your dog's mouth and they won't um, even notice it because they're completely fixated on the trigger ahead. Um, and so that's also an indication that your dog is over threshold. Even though they're not going for a big show of reaction, they're still... Um, not able to use their thinking brain anymore. Um, and so we need to kind of move back away. Um, and again, with thresholds, just like with triggers, you can have a very clear threshold. So some dogs, it's, you know, other dogs are fine as long as they're 30 feet away or more. If they get closer to 30 feet, they start um, reacting. Other dogs have um, kind of murky threshold depends on the trigger, especially with dogs who tend to have multiple triggers, the thresholds then get a lot more murky. Um, and some dogs will have very, very large thresholds. So some dogs will start 
reacting or getting fixated when they see something hundreds of yards away or more. Um, some dogs even react without seeing the thing. So especially in the case of dog-dog reactivity, a lot of dog reactive dogs will be triggered by the sound of tags or something that sounds like tags, so jangling keys and they'll start looking for the trigger. Um, another thing to keep in mind too when it comes to threshold is whether the trigger is moving or not. So stationary triggers, things that are not moving, um, tend to be easier. That means your threshold will be smaller, so you can get a little bit closer to it before your dog kind of loses their focus. Um, versus if a trigger is moving, typically your threshold will be much larger, especially if the trigger is moving towards you, right, approaching, because they're closing the distance. Another thing that we want to be mindful of, and that's really important, is the concept of trigger stacking. So with trigger stacking, it's really the interplay of multiple triggers, um, things that maybe your dog doesn't react to normally, but because they're happening all at the same time or very close together in time, it's pushing your dog over the limit. So a good example is um, a dog who doesn't love thunder. Most dogs don't love it. Some dogs are very phobic of thunder. Some dogs are kind of fine, but most of the dogs kind of have a little bit of nervousness when thunder is around. Um, so let's say I'm going for a walk or storm is brewing. It's not thundering yet, but it's kind of getting there. You know, you can feel it. Uh, and then my dog sees um, a stroller walk by. Uh, no big deal. My dog doesn't usually react to stroller, but you know, we don't love strollers. They kind of look a little bit odd. Um, and then there's a dog barking somewhere in the neighborhood. So same thing, my dog doesn't usually react to just barking dogs. Um, but now, because there's a storm brewing, we just saw a stroller and it's dog barking, then my dog is just losing completely focus and will start to bark. Um, so that is trigger stacking, that each component individually would be fine. So walking you know, before, before a storm would be okay. Seeing a stroller out of, you know, in of itself is fine. Hearing a dog bark in a distance, not a problem. But when you put all those three together, then my dog is over threshold um, and they just react. So we wanna be mindful of that when we work on it because obviously we wanna carefully evaluate the environment um, and adjust our threshold accordingly. If there's a skateboard to my left, a dog approaching there and a jogger coming, um, you know, my dog is pretty much being set up to have some kind of a meltdown. So I need to back away, find a spot that is maybe further away from the skateboard um, or further away from the jogger so that it's easier for my dog to process the environment without getting um, overly kind of anxious about things. Um, so, you know, now that we've talked about triggers and thresholds, let's talk a little bit about intervention strategies. So what do we typically do um, with dogs who are reactive? So the first thing is distance, distance, distance. Distance is your best friend. Whether you have a fear-based reactive dog or an excitement-based reactive dog, distance will always make things better. So with our fearful dogs, distance is actually what they want, right? They see something, a trigger coming, they're afraid of it. They wanna get as far away from it as possible. So by moving away, we're giving them that nice release of pressure, like, oh, oh oof, that was close, but we got away. With our um, excitement-based reactive dogs, the closer they get, the more excited they become. So by increasing distance, then they're able to calm down and process the thing <laughs> that they're seeing with a little bit more um, focus. And again, we're going back into using our thinking brain instead of, oh, there's somebody coming, oh my God, I can't focus on anything. So distance, distance, distance. If anything, if you can't work on anything else, distance is your best friend. So getting more distance from the trigger. Um, Another thing that we want to do too with a lot of reactive dogs is redirect their attention. So like I said before, typically reactive dogs, when they spot a trigger, will fixate. So they'll stare at it um, and then they'll just kind of escalate from there to full-blown reaction. So we want to be able to kind of break that eye contact and get them to focus on something else. So we use kind of three broad techniques to help dogs um, redirect their attention. The first one is look at me, right? So we cue our dogs to look at me. They earn reinforcement for looking at me. Um, and by having a dog look at you, then they can't fixate on the trigger. The second thing we use, I use a lot, is go find. And that's usually just 
scattering a bunch of cookies on the floor or in the grass. So my dogs focus shift downward and they're looking and sniffing for food. Therefore, they're not staring at the trigger anymore. And the third thing I use a lot too is a U-turn. So we see something approaching, well, let's turn around and walk away. Um, so that again, my dog is not able to fix it. Now, it's important to note with all of those three things, look, go find, and U-turn, you need to do these things when your dog is under threshold, right? If your dog is past the point of eating food, being able to respond to their name, being able to walk with you on a loose leash, you're too close to the trigger, um, and then you won't be able to do any of these things. So you do want to make sure that you implement those three things or one of those three things at a big enough distance that your dog has seen the scary thing or the exciting thing, but they're not starting to react to it yet. Um, the third thing that is really important when we're working with reactivity is counter conditioning. Um, and so counter conditioning is really changing the association to the trigger. So, you know, something that a dog has a negative feeling Two, we want to pair that trigger with something the dog really enjoys so that we change that kind of emotional um, feeling about the thing. So for instance, um, I don't like roaches. Roach, I'm not phobic of roaches, but I really don't like roaches. Um, so if you were to counter condition me to being okay or neutral to roaches, what you could do is print a picture of a roach, have it far away, about 20 feet away. And every time I looked at it, you would feed me a cookie, right? So uh, am I going to love roaches from now? Probably not, but instead of having that uh, uh, roach, oh, oh, roach means cookie. And again, with every intervention strategy that we're discussing, your threshold is very important, right? If your dog is already in the process of reacting or too close, you cannot counter condition because there are already experiences that negative feeling. So you do want to be at a distance where your dog has a neutral reaction, right? They see the thing, but they don't really, it's not close enough for them to have any kind of feeling about it. And then we want to pair that with really, really yummy stuff. So with dogs, that usually means having really high value treats like chicken, hot dogs, liver, cheese, really, really good stuff that they really enjoy. And every time they spot a trigger, Bam, they get a cookie. They have nothing to do um, except just look at it and we feed them so that it's really straight up association. Um, what we usually do too with counter conditioning is the process called desensitization. And that is the process of exposing a dog to a trigger at a very, very low level. Again, threshold, right? So we want to be at the point where the dog sees the thing but doesn't have um, big, strong feelings about it um, so that they get used to seeing it. And then gradually, as they get more confident and comfortable around it, we'll just kind of keep getting closer and closer. Um, and that's also very useful for our um, excitement-based reactive dogs, that they can see a thing at a distance, maintain calm behavior, and get rewarded for being calm. And so that, see, if you're calm, you get to engage and see the thing. The calmer you are, the closer we can get. Um, with our fearful dogs, obviously, we do want to, again, with the sensitization, gradually increase the um, intensity of the trigger, but we don't necessarily want to get closer and closer and closer to the point where they actually have to be very close because, again, um, we don't want to get them over threshold and fearful, but we do want to build that nice neutral response, right? Oh, there's a dog. Okay, no big deal. I'm fine. Let's walk away and do something else. Um, when we talk about condition, counter conditioning, it's really also important to discuss flooding. So flooding is um, also known as exposure therapy, and that is pretty much exposing the dog to the trigger at full intensity until the dog stops reacting. And that is something we do not want to do, right? Um, why? Well, because first of all, it's incredibly stressful, right? I hate roaches. If you were to put me in a tub full of roaches, I would have a meltdown for sure. Um, I would probably be traumatized. Um, and it's very likely that I would be even more fearful of roaches after that, right? So we do not want to put our dogs um, in a situation where they're flooded and they have to experience the trigger at full intensity with no escape um, because that also leads 
leads to learned helplessness. And that is um, when our dogs is completely shut down, pretty much they've learned there's no way to escape the bad thing. Um, you're stuck there, you have to take it in and they just completely shut down um, and go within themselves. And while, you know, on the surface, it might look like, well, that's not so bad, right? My dog is not reacting at that point. Uh, but learned helplessness comes with a lot of displaced anxiety. So your dog will be more anxious. Um, and so while they might start reacting to that particular trigger, it's very likely they'll start displacing that reactivity to something else. And a lot of times too, especially with dog-dog reactive um, dogs, when they're flooded, what tends to happen is they stop reacting when they're on leash or when you're here because you've been associated with, I can't escape when my person is near me or when the leash is on. But as soon as those things are taken away, so if the dog is loose or if you're not around, um, they will aggress um, pretty violently. So I've seen a lot of dogs who started off as reactive, who were flooded into stopping reacting, who have killed and maimed dogs later because they were so traumatized by the flooding experience that Anytime they could access another dog and they just went and killed it because then you can't hurt me anymore. So we really want to be very careful, again, of our thresholds. And when we do counter conditioning and desensitization, we want to work at a distance where we're nice and far away so our dog can have that neutral of, oh, okay, it's there, I see it, I know it's there, but I'm safe because I'm far enough away. And with our excitement dogs, oh, there's a thing. Oh, but it's too far for me to get excited about it, so I'm just going to watch it and get cookies for being calm. And then as I'm calmer and calmer, I get to get closer and closer. Um, so those are pretty much, you know, with reactivity in a nutshell, um, making sure that again, we identify our dog's triggers so that we know what they are and we can avoid them. Um, and then building that nice distance so that our dogs feel safe and are, are calmer. Um, redirecting their attention away from the trigger so they can't fixate and then escalate into a reaction. And then creating strong positive associations to triggers. So when we see something, um, it's paired with cookies, something we enjoy um, so that we can shape those nice um, alternate behaviors too. So when you see something that you're excited about or worried about, if you sit and look at me, you'll get cookies and then we'll walk away and do something else. Right, so that we covered a big chunk of reactivity. So I would say, let's see if we have some. We do. I'm not sure we have. We do. We've got some good ones here. So if you guys are uh, listening, please feel free to drop your questions in the comments. We're going to do some Q and A right now. So the first one we have is from Alexis. Can a dog acting out of fear easily or quickly cross into overexcitement and vice versa? Um, I would say. Yes, kind of. So you have, I mean, it's not uncommon for dogs to be conflicted, to kind of be in between where they're excited about a dog, but not quite sure what to do. And then it kind of is murky feelings about it. And I usually see that a lot with dogs who weren't socialized properly. So they see a dog and they kind of, oh, I'm a social person or I'm a social dog. I kind of want to say hi, but I don't know what to do. And so they get closer and then they start freaking out and then they just kind of tip. Um, right into fearful reactivity, even though they were initially excited about the prospect of saying hi. Um, with some breeds too, so some breeds that are pretty prone to over arousal in general, you can definitely have um, something that started out of fear tip into over arousal. So I would say it's not excitement as in happy, I'm excited, yay kind of feeling, um, but very strong feelings just create that very strong drive and then the usually that tips them into full-blown aggression from there. All right, our next question here from Keisha. For someone socializing a young puppy, would you encourage them to avoid socializing on leash to avoid creating excitement reactivity? All right, that's a very, very good question. Um, typically, yes. So I would say my personal preference when I work with puppies on leash is for them not to greet other dogs on leash at all. We can see dogs on leash. Usually I like to um, actually try and see. You see a dog on leash, you offer a calm behavior, you get cookies and you get to see the dog. Um, I might do parallel walks with other dogs so my dog can experience being close to another dog, walking together. Um, and that way too, when you do have a greeting, it's a lot um, calmer greeting typically because they've walked together for a while. There's no face-to-face -face approach. You don't have that excitement of <gasps> getting closer and closer and closer. Um, and then 
potentially getting the puppy in trouble if the dog saying hi to your puppy is not um, the most tolerant dog or the most appropriate dog to say hi to puppies. Um, so in a nutshell, typically, yes, when I have puppies socializing, we don't say hi to other dogs on leash, unless it's a dog I know very well, a dog that is 100% safe with puppies, um, that I know my the other dog is not going to react to my puppy or snap or get um, overly annoyed that the puppy is <laughs> saying hi, as a puppy would, usually they tend to be very um, enthusiastic with, with greetings. And if you do allow your puppy to say hi, then you can shape the way your puppy says hi, right? Just because my puppy is allowed to say hi doesn't mean I'm going to let it run full speed at the end of the leash, go tackle the other dog, right? Can you sit? Oh, very good. Okay, go say hi. Okay, come away. So that even if we're practicing an actual greeting, we're practicing a calm and polite greeting and not, you know, free for all, go yeah. tackle. And I, this kind of goes back to something you said earlier in the conversation too about socializing puppies. You know, of course we want our dogs to be social and we want them to be comfortable around other dogs, but if as a young puppy we set them up with this idea that every person who walks by and every dog who walks by you get to sit, say hi to then we're almost setting them up for failure because then they're teenagers and they struggle with impulse control they've been used to that and so yeah. they then go i want to say hi to that person they don't get to because now we're learning leash manners and now all of a sudden we become really frustrated so you know i think that goes into to the value of socialization that it's not saying hi to everybody more often than not it's learning how to be quiet how mm -hmm. to pay attention how to be neutral to all of these things around them all right we've got another question here from alexis um, does the type of reactivity fear versus excitement based affect when or how a dog should be able to greet another dog uh, on or off leash yes and no so, so yes, yes. I would say, especially when it comes to on-leash greetings, whether your dog is fear-based or excitement-based, reactive, the process is pretty much the same, is that you want you know, the dogs to walk together parallel at a distance first, gradually getting closer so that A, your fearful dog can get more comfortable and relax and get used to the other dog being there and that the other dog is safe. And if you have an excitement-based dog that they can relax and kind of take the edge off of it instead of, oh my God, um, you know, usually after a few minutes, like, oh, whatever, we've been walking together. It's pretty boring now. Um, I don't typically, again, I don't like having dogs say hi on leash. Um, it is not my favorite thing to do because the leash gets in the way of the dog's movement. It gets in the way of how they can communicate because they use body posture and language to talk to each other. Um, we make things worse typically because we hold the leash too tight or we pull on the leash at the point where it's not the right moment to pull on the leash um, or we hold them back. So typically, you know, the leash just has a lot more complications than not. Um, that being said, it can be really tough for reactive dogs off leash because then you have no control of how the dogs approach each other. Um, so I would say, you know, if you have a reactive dogs and you want to work on them saying hi or putting another dog, um, definitely get a, an experienced trainer involved because we have experience in managing those kinds of interaction. Um, and we're able to do greetings on long lines um, pretty safely because we know when to hold the dog back and how when to let them say hi and how long to let them say hi because we're looking at you know body language um, because it's very subtle, especially with dogs in close proximity. It's very easy to miss those very subtle signals that things are not going well. Um, and usually that's what happens. So dogs say hi, oh, they look fine, they're wagging their tail, and then two seconds in, ah, a fight starts and we go, whoa. I didn't see that coming. Um, experienced trainers <laughs> see that coming because we know what to look out for. Um, and we also know how to set it up um, so that it's safe for everybody and we're doing it things at the right time. Yep. All right. Got a great question here. Sneha says, uh, can overexcitement turn into fear? For example, if my dog is over threshold and I increase the distance and give him an alternative cue like touch or look or go sniff so that he can stop fixating on that passing dog, would it be interpreted by him as needing to be fearful of that other dog? 
Not typically. Um, I would say usually the excitement tips into fear when they're allowed to go say hi and then get into a fight because they said hi inappropriately. But it's way more likely that you're going to get a dog that comes from excitement into fear reactivity when those things happen. Well, they just they keep getting bad experiences with dogs versus then having no experiences with the dog, right? So by walking away, um, you know, what you're actually teaching your dog is that there's a way to get closer. By being calmer, you can get to get see the dog. If you're too excited, you're gonna walk away, which is actually also very useful in teaching your dog's polite manners, right? That this is not a way you're gonna interact with any other dog or person. You need to do something else. Um, focus on me, be calm, and then you get to interact with the thing. So, you know, with an overexcited excited dog, removing them from the trigger, removing them away does not lead, or lead them to be fearful of that trigger. Um, typically, unless they have that kind of mixed emotion where they're excited but kind of fearful at the same time. And if you're playing with those, then, you know, the fear can sometimes crop up. But if you have, you know, Typical teenager, of, oh my God, there's a person, let's go say hi this second. And you walk them away and get them to focus on something else. They are not um, going to tip into being fearful of, of people. Um, they're just going to learn that we don't get to interact with people when we're being told basket cases. Yep. <laughs> and they're going to learn that disengaging from dogs is better. So yes, walking, and walking away is very rewarding. That excitement quite a bit. All right. So Kelsey says... I've heard that uh, never letting dogs meet on leash can help reduce the reactivity to other dogs because they never get to meet them. What would you recommend? Again, I tend to agree. Once again, I'm not a fan of, of on-leash greetings um, just because they tend to go poorly most of the time. Um, that being said, with fearful reactive dogs, you, it's a very fine balance, but you do want them to um, get exposure to the things they're worried about so they can learn that it's safe, right? Because a lot of times I see with fearful reactive dogs is people stop walking our dogs all together because it's so stressful and I get that. It's incredibly stressful for the dogs and for the person holding the leash when you have a reactive dog. And so when you have a yard, you're like, well, why bother walking the dog and just play in the yard? Um, that tends to make the fear worse because the dog is then stuck on all those bad experiences and they never have positive experiences to counteract. So they've stuck. Dogs are bad, dogs will kill me. I've been proven right every single time. And because I have never had a good experience with another dog, then that's gonna be very strongly cemented. Um, so we do want them to have nice, neutral, and or even better positive experiences with their trigger. Um, and that doesn't mean saying hi. A lot of fearful dogs, reactive dogs, will never get to say hi to other dogs. That's not the goal. Yeah. My goal is not to get the fearful reactive dog to be social butterfly, let's go to the dog park. My goal is to get my fearful reactive dog to be neutral to most dogs in an urban normal setting, right? That I can walk my dog across the neighborhood and see other dogs passing on leash fairly calmly without it being very stressful for me or my dog, right? Um, but typically, um, saying hi to other dogs and being social to other dogs is not the end goal with fearful reactive dogs um, and it also goes into most dogs do not want to say hi and play with every other dog they see puppies yes puppies want to play with everybody everybody's my friend we need to play with everyone we see teenagers also tend to be in that category but most adult dogs have their friends and they're fine with that and they don't really care about other dogs um just like us right um, once you're an adult, you don't want to be friends with every person you meet. Um, you have your friends. Sometimes you meet somebody else that's, oh, well, that's a nice new friend. Um, but so I think we people create a lot of issues for ourselves and our dog by wanting our dogs to be friendly and social to everybody we see. Um, and we pressure them into um, saying hi and be friends. And so we sometimes create that reactivity because we always encourage them to engage even when they don't want to. And so they learn that, you know, there's subtle signals of, I don't really, I would rather go walk away, that we don't hear that. And so they have to go way loud and scream for us to be like, well, I guess we're not saying hi to this one. Um, so again, you know, I think it's, again, the focus on saying hi to other dogs is, is really not the main um, focus with reactive dogs. It's really to get that nice neutral response. Yep, awesome. All right, so this next one hits home. For I'm sure it will for a lot of people, whether your dog is excited or 
uh, stressed out by the presence of other dogs. So Sneha says, sometimes when I'm walking my dog, I notice that other dog owners have their dogs on retractable leashes and they just let their dog come over and greet my dog. The distance in this case doesn't help because their leash is retractable and it just keeps going. I've stopped, I've stopped leash greetings and strictly avoid it. What else can I do in this situation to stop my dog from getting excited and continue to focus on me? Um, so that's where you want to be really proactive um, and really be careful about the environment. So when I walk my dogs, where, whether they're reactive or not, I'm always looking 100 yards in every direction. Mm -hmm. So that if there's a retractable dog, I see it long before that retractable leash can get to me and yeah. we're going to do something else. So I might turn around and walk, change my walking pattern or I might have my dog sit and focus on me while the dog passes or to see which way they're going to go. Um, but, you know, a lot of it is in Again, the same thing happens with off-leash dogs that just kind of crop up out of nowhere and like, oh, oh my God. Um, so being aware of the environment is, you know, one of the easiest things that you can do to prevent um, those scary things from happening and getting surprised and caught off guard. Um, the second is really working diligently with your dog um, to have them offer attention when they see other dogs. Um, so a nice thing too, if your dog is, isn't overly reactive, um, what I like to do is to work around dog parks um, and then, you know, dogs are playing in a dog park and we cue attention and we get cookies and we walk away. The dog, look at me so that my dog gets used to even dogs moving, running and barking at a distance is a cue to focus on me so that when we encounter those loose dogs or dogs that are attached to seemingly no one because they're on a retractable, um, it's pretty cemented in my dog. Like, oh, dog, I'm supposed to look at you, right? Yes, that's right. Let's get cookies and walk away so that we can have that nice little <laughs> redirection and, and able to escape with, without getting stuck in, there's a dog right in my face. Yeah, the other thing, this, this happens to me a lot and it drives me insane. Um, <laughs> so two other things that I will add to that is don't be afraid to move off the trail. So depending on how narrow or wide your trail is, I will like climb off the trail up into the woods if I need to, to create more space. Because remember at the end of the day, your job is protecting your dog. Mm -hmm. Make sure that they don't have negative experiences, that everything can be neutral or positive. So I don't want my dog, even if they are friendly, getting rushed up on by a dog that's not going to be managed. So I will use management and do what I can to create more space. And as a last resort, don't be afraid to use your voice and talk to the other pet owner because a lot of the times these people that have their dogs on flexi leashes and are just letting their dogs come up and say hi, they don't mean to harm you or your dog. They are they just are not aware. And so a lot of the times I'll say something like, hi, we're training, we can't say hi today or do you mind getting your dog closer, or my dog isn't friendly, and I'll have those things ready to go depending on what dog I'm working with so that I'm communicating to them that I would appreciate it if they kind of reel their dog in on that leash, and that can help tremendously as well. So don't be afraid to, you know, be kind, but communicate with the other people around you, you know, to see if that will help you as well. Um, let's see, we got another one here from Kelsey. Um, how... Um, how do you tell the other people at the park that you're working on reactivity and don't want your dog to meet theirs? Some helpful phrases. Um, I mean, it really depends on, on, on people. Typically, I try to set myself up at a distance so that even when people disregard um, my warnings, I can still get away pretty quickly because I've had many people completely blatantly ignore um, my warnings that the dog is reactive. It's fine. I don't mind. Well, yeah, I do because the dog is going to bite you. Um, but typically, yes, you know, my dog isn't friendly. Um, can you please keep your distance? Um, my dog is, is shy and fearful. Do you mind staying a bit further away because we're working on it? Um, a lot of times I find it useful to, um, if you're working to be really engaged with your dog because then the person can't make eye contact with you. Um, and so then they typically just kind of go, oh, well, I guess I'm interrupting. So typically my first go-to, because again, it's not always, um, you know, very uh, comforting when you're already working with your reactive dog around triggers. You're already tense and nervous and you're focused on your dog. Having to go into a conversation with a person and ask them to stay away and not know how they're going to respond to it and just, you know, because you're already on edge. 
I personally find it very useful to just focus on my dog. So I usually, you know, if I'm hot, oh, very good, let's leave that, let's go this way, very good, and I'll walk away and just be completely focused on my dog, and I find that that actually helps stop a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, because then it's very clear that you're not wanting to engage with them, and that you're focused on your dog, and that you're actually working on something. Um, so that's usually my go-to, or again, just saying, I'm sorry, we're working on something, my dog is fearful, please give us some space. Um, but typically, I'll just just kind of walk away. I'm, a lot of times, just oh, okay, we're just going to do something else for a little bit, and we'll come right back. <laughs> all right, let's see here. Um, mm -hmm. All right, this is a good one too. So, Amy, it sounds like she's been successfully working with her reactive dog, and they've made a bunch of progress playing the look at that game using their clicker and treats. Um, so she says. Am I missing a step to be able to walk by without stepping off to the side every time? Or is this what we will always need to do? This is a good one. Um, I think it depends on your dog, honestly, um, and how strong of reactivity they have to begin with, um, how strong their feelings are. Um, I have personally, one of my dogs is dog aggressive. Um, so he will, if close enough, he will go bite um, and hurt another dog. So obviously we've made great strides where in most neighborhoods he can be on leash with dogs, you know, um, within 20 feet without being reactive. But I will never, ever let him get within 15 feet of another dog. Ever, 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 never, never. Um, so while he's neutral and looks on the outside like he's calm, we're always going to step away. We're always going to do U-turn. A lot of times we're avoiding dogs as much as we can because, again, it's not safe for him or anyone um, to try and get past that point. Um, if you have mild reactivity, you can definitely you know, have a goal of to be able to pass dogs without having to step off. Um, but again, that's very dependent on your own dog and, and the severity of their reactivity um, and how strong their feelings are about things. And yeah. typically also how many tri triggers they have. It's a lot easier when you have a dog with very well-defined trigger um, because you can focus on, on creating a really strong positive association to that trigger. When you have a dog with multiple triggers, so with dog reactive dogs, you know that's a dog that reacts to most dogs, whether regardless of size, um, coloring, it's just dog that, um, that gets a lot harder to get closer, especially because it's complicated by the fact that in motion is a lot harder. And when you're passing, you're approaching and getting closer and closer to the trigger. And that tends to stir big feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and then the oncoming dog is also talking to your dog. They're not, you know, if every dog you pass was a neutral dog, things would be so easy because the other dog would be just blank slate, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but most of the time, the oncoming dog gets excited, gives your dog eye contact, might be reactive themselves. Um, and so all of those things come into it. So typically with most reactive dogs, I find that you still kind of have to work in some distance when you're passing other, other triggers. Yep. All right. So we're going to take a break here from the Q&A. Now, Camille, you have some exciting things that we're going to be launching here. So I want to take a moment to talk about that. Um, we are going to be having, which you may have seen on our page, um, a webinar series where people can have working spots or audit spots to help tackle some of this reactivity and gain the tools that they need to help their dogs with it. So can you talk to um, potential, um, there are people listening here that are dealing with reactivity, what they can expect and, and how your webinar series will work? Sure, sure. Um, so we know with the pandemic too, we know that a lot of people have had puppies and then socialization experience have been limited because obviously no one is going anywhere. Um, and also because trainers are not seeing people in person or are being swamped, that it's getting very difficult to get in-person help. Um, so that's why we really wanted to create some kind of a, you know, virtual online uh, platform to work on reactivity because, you know, again, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, that would still get people a lot of the knowledge and hands-on things that we would do in person. So we're doing webinars, um, workshops. What we're going to do is pretty much have um, a lecture on one day, which is going to be Wednesdays um, at 7 p.m. And the lecture is going to go over the topic and three skills um, to work on. And we're going to kind of go through each skill and kind of give you a nice guide and step-by-step -step process so that you can practice on your own at home. And then the following Friday, 
we'll do another session where we go over feedback. So um, our working spots, you'll be able to send in um, video from your homework, and then we'll kind of dissect those um, during our Friday session so we can go over um, homework feedback of you know what you should do, how to change that, how to troubleshoot if something is not working as it should. Um, and then if you're an auditor, you get to see both sessions and you get to ask questions and see what we're working on, which is still very useful. Um, because then you can have the feedback of other people of, oh, I struggle with the same thing with my dog. Here's how it's been addressed. Um, and we're splitting our reactive series into three different parts. So we have our first part is going to be pretty much um, attention foundations. So working on the look, name game, touch, making sure we can get our dog's attention quickly and reliably and kind of keep their attention on us even when there's things happening around. Um, our second part is going to be leash foundations, especially with dogs who are reactive on leash. Having, um, you know, nice loose leash walking is important because any leash tension tends to throw them in for a loop into more more reaction. Um, and we're going to work on leash skills and how to get U-turns very smoothly without yanking our dogs around. Um, working on those mechanics because it's difficult. You know, you have your dog, you have your treats, you have your. You know, there's a thing coming. We're freaking out. What are we doing? So it's really important to kind of work on mechanics for ourselves and our dogs so that everything is really nice and smooth and every, everybody knows what's going to happen. And then the third part is going to be counter conditioning. So building those nice, strong, positive associations to triggers, so that our dogs can then, you know, instead of seeing something and go, <clears throat> they go, oh, yeah, I like that. That's not too bad. Um, and, and work that out. So we are going to have, um, there's a link in this description uh, where you can sign up. You can purchase each one individually. You can also buy them as a complete package of three and you do get some savings if you purchase them that way. And at the time of sign up, you get to decide if you want that audit spot where you just get to watch all the material but you don't get feedback or if you're really ready to kind of tackle this material and help your dog. Um, and then that working spot is gonna be a really nice fit because like Camille said, mechanics are the hardest part of this. Not only teaching the skills, but getting the skills up to that real world level and then managing all of your interactions. Because like Camille was talking about, knowing what your, your triggers are, knowing what your threshold is for each of those triggers and knowing exactly what to do with your dog based on each individual setup is really what is going to make the biggest difference in terms of success. So if you guys are interested, you can sign up using that link. If you have questions for us, please let us know. You can drop them in the comments here or you can shoot us an email or a private message here through Facebook and we will be happy to get to those so that you guys kind of figure out what this webinar will be all about and see if it's a good fit for you. Camille, thank you so much for talking with us today. That's absolutely wonderful. Tons of great information as always and the delivery was awesome. It's always entertaining listening to you. I love it. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you so much.